The Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me! Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up. He is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. God, spread your love in this place, intertwine your spirit of every fiber of our being, speak through me and in spite of me, for I am a mere vessel of your word and your will. Holy Spirit, do something amazing, have your way. Think about one person that you know who gave the world to you or to others. Maybe you think of a matriarch or a patriarch of your family. Possibly this person might have been a church member. Maybe it was a good friend of yours. Maybe you can't think of anyone. It's possible that this person you're thinking of has lived and lives on through their footprints of gratitude. Maybe they're still existing in their earthly existence and body. One thing that is certain, friends, is that the people who serve have made a lasting imprint on our lives. One person that I know made an imprint on my life and many others was my grandmother, Ruth. She was certainly a powerful voice for women in ministry, supported many, including myself, in the call to ministry, cultivated fields which she lived on, and was able to cultivate souls that grew in their faith through her messages, her Bible studies, and most of all, her presence. Sometimes one of the greatest assets is to be present, not distracted by earthly things, but to be present in the moment. That is what my grandmother demonstrated, what her sister Marie lives on to share in her ministry, 
and what I hope to do and strive to do in my own ministry for many years to come. 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world or things in the world. The love of the Father is not in those who love the world. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride in riches, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desire are passing away, but those who do the will of God will live forever. Here ends this reading. Friends, I am not sure this ending is really talking about mortal or even spiritual eternity. It is possible that the writer of 1 John was talking about using the gifts that we have been given to impact the world and for that impact to live perpetually. Something unique that my family chose to do in my grandmother's obituary was to invite people to give in memory of her to a church of their choice. Instead of setting a specific church or churches to give in lieu of flowers, this decision likely will cause many churches to be blessed by the gifts in memory of my grandmother. She served many churches, and in her ministry, and many will remember the stories of her, and will remember those intimate conversations, the powerful sermons, and the most impactful and moving worship experiences. I know personally, after the Maundy Thursday service, drinking the rest of the grape juice from the communion cup holders was definitely something I remember for letting us do as children and how meaningful that was to me. I'm sure there was something special about letting us do that, which carried me towards my ministry and what I have been able to instill upon children as well. Whether it's having them being involved in ministry, whether it's having them help in serving communion, or carrying the light of Christ to light the candles. It is a joy to see children in worship together. She believed in children and not shunning them for what they wear, what they say in worship, but to let them participate in the fullness of the church. And that is hard to find in a lot of pastors. It is likely that there were many that were grateful for this attitude towards children, because many would just not care or acknowledge them or their gifts in ministry. Now, you know, it's possible that because she was also a school teacher, she found appreciation and was there for the children that other people would not be there for. She was also a guidance counselor and then went into school administration and then retired and went towards preaching, where she was able to use those gifts of teaching in so many amazing ways. And I give thanks for her footprint that she left on my life. And that seed that was planted in her ministry that will flourish, that will blossom in so many ways. That she's prayed for, that she's sought after in times of uncertainty, in times where it felt like there was no hope left, but she knew hope lives on. Looking at this gospel passage, 
we would be hard-pressed to not find someone that was impacted by another person. Any guesses? Jesus rings a bell. Many people were impacted by the ministry and healing of Jesus. Whether it would be the simple sight of him as an infant, and the man recognizing the uniqueness of Jesus in that moment, to the moments he healed, like this one, healing someone who could not physically see. There were so many other moments, and we share about them in so many ways in worship. And we give thanks for the footprints that he left as well. He made a lasting impact that has carried us forward in our desire to grow in love and care, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world, spreading that gospel of love to the world, spreading compassion to the world, spreading hope and joy to the corners of the world that might not even know hope and joy exists. Because, friends, that is what we're called to do with our own footprints, carrying with us those loved ones, those friends, those people who we have been blessed to know and share in God's love together to continue the outreach that they started and to start some outreach of our own. You know, Mark doesn't really touch on the idea of the mysticism of Jesus, but talks a lot in these healing stories about faith of these individual people. If we see it says, your faith has made you well, to go in peace, proclaim it, to share in faith together. Not saying that just Jesus made them well, but their faith. Now, I do believe that Jesus performed amazing miracles, including this one. But it takes faith in those miracles for something to occur. It takes faith for a person to shout in the crowd to get the attention of Jesus when they can't physically see down the street. It takes faith for Mary to pour expensive nard onto Jesus' feet and to have that faith that what she's doing meant something, meant more than just something, because friends, it did. In many ways, we have to gain that same type of faith in what is not seen currently, but what is to come. We cannot just mope around, waiting for things to get done, and we're just going to sit here, and we're not going to do anything. Because, friends, our faith calls us to action. And not just sitting around saying, woe is me. And to have a sense of faith takes a lot of courage. Now, of course, there are moments that are completely appropriate to say, woe is me. And to have a sense of grief in the air. But we should strive to be positive in our approach in what is possible, and to work together in accomplishing that which God is calling us to do. Another angle that I'd like to take in this story is that of the beggar who happened to be blind. Maybe you have experienced silencing from others, discouragement, disapproval, or other negative effects, maybe even in the job, marketplace, or work. 
Maybe you've not been chosen even though you deserved the position. Maybe those people who have been close to you or even those that don't know you have cast judgment upon you. You know, Jesus did not know this person, but he instantly connected with him in faith that he carried with him. Maybe that's why Jesus said in the Beatitudes that blessed are the poor for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I'm not so sure that Jesus wanted another task that day. Maybe he was tired, maybe he was thirsty, but he went up to that beggar and talked with him. And he did it with faith leading the way. He took that step. Just as the beggar took that huge leap forward, of courage, hope, optimism, and a childlike naivety that caused him to say in the midst of the crowd, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many people like to be timid. They like to not say much. It makes us comfortable. But, you know, in many ways, I wonder if he was more comfortable by doing that. It doesn't say that he whispered it. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It says he shouted. And it says he shouted again because it was urgent. It was important. And it's something that needed to be done. That he knew Jesus could do. Maybe that startled the crowd. Maybe it even startled Jesus by hearing that shouting. It's possible that Jesus, a person who saw peace in the world, found discomfort by hearing that loud voice and shouting. Thinking about that man, he could not physically see Jesus. Friends, he could not see Jesus physically. So he took with a huge jump of faith because he was present there and knew that Jesus was present. That says a lot about this person's faith. But it also says a lot about the faith of the crowd that wanted to hush or silence the beggar too. This idea that he came shouting and was unable to even see Jesus physically in all reality be assured that he could sense Jesus coming and he could sense that which Jesus was capable of doing along his journey because he had faith. He knew that it was possible. He had some more faith than even Jesus' disciples. Likely. It says that he followed Jesus at the end of this passage on the journey. Sometimes following Jesus can be ignoring the negativity the discouragement. And it can be proving people wrong. It is possible to take that leap of faith. But it takes a lot of determination and a lot of faith along the way. It takes a willing heart and a soul that in some ways sees Things that are not humanly possible, but God makes them possible. As we get into these colder months, I'd like you to consider what God is calling us to do here at Arts United Methodist Church. We can come up with a million reasons why not to do something, but friends, we have to be overly optimistic. Just like that person who was physically unable to see. 
and put our trust that what God is calling us and guiding us to do is the work that we are given from God and that's ordained in many ways by the Holy Spirit that God is going to provide for those things that God is calling us to do because friends I believe that with all of my heart and my being and I realize there are likely some of you that think that it's okay to doubt that this is not possible or we can't do that but friends God is calling Calling us to do something, and I believe God will provide. We are called to make a difference in this community and in turn the world. Thinking about things that are possible, maybe there's something you wanted to do over time, but you've been discouraged by a crowd, maybe even just one person. Don't let others who don't have the faith in the unseen or not yet seen, or those who have little faith, little desire, tell you who has a large amount of faith and a calling from God, our Creator, what is capable. We have to start somewhere. And if in your heart you feel led to do something, then do just that. If you need help discovering your gifts or want to share those ideas to cultivate them into a reality, I would love to talk with you about them. Sometimes one conversation can lead into a movement. We never know the next person who is going to create a new thing that God is calling and God is blessing in so many ways. And we give thanks for those who God calls to that work. I am grateful for the work that we have done this month in our ministry together as we've already collected an abundance, an amazing abundance of items for mothers that are incarcerated with their children. And of course, as many of you know, I am grateful for the ministry that we have done so far that I have been, as long as I have been here as your pastor. What we have done so far in ministry is just a small step in the giant leap that I believe we will do together with God's help and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of faith sprinkled along the journey. Maybe it's poured out, because sprinkles are sometimes not enough. I encourage you to pray about what you are capable of doing. Not what others say you can do, but what you yourself can do in ministry to help transform the world. You know, in many ways, if I listen to a lot of the people who are naysayers, I would likely not be up here as your pastor but I believe the work that God has called and God has led me to do with the wonderful people I have been called to serve hand in hand with. And I give thanks for that call, for that warming of heart, for that Aldersgate moment, much like John Wesley experienced, the strangely warmed heart And in many ways, I give thanks for each one of you that shares in that together as well. I'd like to take a moment now to invite you to put in the chat a name. Now, don't hit send yet. A name that you are grateful for, who has helped you discover your gifts in ministry, maybe inspired you in your walk, Maybe they just bring, brought you joy in many ways. You might want to put multiple names, and that's completely fine. So I invite you now to write a name in the chat. Let's hit send in three seconds. One, two, three. Hit send.
As you're reading those, I'd like to share with you that it's a joy to see the amount of gratitude that exists around us. Gratitude is not just something we should think about this time of year, but it should be a springboard towards a more gentle, more grateful, more grace-filled life and faith. May this work that we are called to, as difficult as it might seem, be blessed and may we not be silenced by the naysayers, but may we proclaim God's love and the gospel message of love and care and joy that Jesus demonstrated in his steps on this earth, his footprints. May we share it to the world. Alleluia. Amen. Let us pray. God, I pray that as we sit here together, as we share in this moment, that your spirit would just touch a soul, that you would give a calling to someone in this place, that you would give a need a desire to do something amazing. I pray that your Holy Spirit will sustain the ministries that we do currently and in the future. That you would provide, that you would send people to this church so that we can continue to be in ministry together, being the hands and feet of Jesus with this community and the world. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, one who healed, the one who loved, and the one who gave his life, so that we might share to the world the message of the joy of abundant, eternal joy and salvation.